So we're going to discuss orbital overlap in reaction mechanisms, and this is covered in the organic reaction mechanisms chapter. First thing we'll look at is orbital interactions. And when a nucleophile reacts with an electrophile, two electrons are donated from a filled orbital of a nucleophile into an empty orbital of the electrophile. And this, this is illustrated in this picture here, where we've got this filled orbital of the nucleophile, this p orbital with a lone pair, and this interacts with the empty orbital of the electrophile and we can show the lone pair of electrons moving towards the empty orbital of the electrophile. Let's now look at some nucleophiles and the orbitals that we can associate with nucleophiles. The first example we'll look at is water. And of course in oxygen we have two lone pairs and these are the nucleophilic sites in water. Those two lone pairs are in sp3 orbitals and so we can draw those orbitals as shown here with one lobe larger than another. Occasionally, you'll see that those orbitals are often drawn as shown here where the lobes are of equal size. So the orange and the brown orbitals are the equal size. More often than not, you'll see this representation used, whereby just one of the lobes are used to show each of the orbitals. So this lone pair and this lone pair here. And this is the representation that we're going to use in this presentation. If we now move on and look at a couple more nucleophiles, the hydroxide ion. And in the hydroxide ion, on oxygen, we have three lone pairs. So these are the three lone pairs, which are all in sp3 orbitals. In ammonia, we have just one lone pair. As shown here, we have the lone pair again in an sp3 orbital. We'll now move on and look at some carbon-based nucleophiles and in particular we'll look at an alkene. And in an alkene it's the pi bond which is the nucleophilic site. And we can represent the pi orbital of the cc bond using these two lobes here and uh, these two dots represent the um, electrons in the pi bond. Alternatively and commonly what you'll see is that atomic orbitals are used to represent the pi bond. So here we've got two p orbitals which combine to make up the pi orbital and they're often used to represent the pi bond and you'll see we've got one electron in each of the p orbitals. Finally, for another nucleophile we've got an organometallic, we've got a carbon lithium bond which is a covalent bond and here you can see the interaction of the s orbital of lithium with the p orbital on carbon and it's this filled sigma orbital which is the nucleophilic site in an organometallic organolithium compound. Let's now move on and look at electrophiles and here we're looking at compounds that contain empty orbitals. So for boron trifluoride, this molecule here, you'll see we've got six outer electrons on boron and we have an empty p orbital readily and available for accepting two further electrons. We have a similar situation for a carbocation. We have six outer electrons on the carbon and we have an empty p orbital. In a carbonyl bond, what we're looking at when, when we react the carbonyl with a nucleophile is the interaction of the nucleophile with the empty pi star orbital. And this is what is drawn here. So this is the pi star orbital that interacts with the nucleophile. Occasionally what you'll see is that the orbitals a drawn of unequal size, so these lobes here are unequal, we have smaller lobes on oxygen than carbon, and this reflects the differences between carbon and oxygen. Finally, we'll look at a couple of other electrophiles, namely a carbon-halogen bond. And in a carbon-halogen bond, when we're looking at orbitals, we're looking at nucleophiles interacting with the empty sigma star orbital, which is drawn here. And in a hydrogen-halogen bond, we're looking again at an empty sigma star orbital, which is drawn here. So the s orbital is on the hydrogen, the p orbital here on the halogen. So let's now consider how orbital overlap controls the angle of attack of a nucleophile on an electrophile. And we'll look at the interaction of the um, lone pair in an sp3 orbital on ammonia with the empty p orbital in boron trifluoride. And as you can see here, these two orbitals can interact with one another. But if ammonia attacks at this orientation, 
we don't maximize the orbital overlap. So this leads to what's described as an unsuccessful bonding interaction. When the ammonia approaches from this orientation, we can maximize the orbital interaction. And so this leads to a successful bonding interaction. Let's now move on and look at a few other further examples like this. And we'll look first of all at how a nucleophile, in this case water, can equally attack from above or below the plane of a carbocation. And we can explain this by looking at the orbitals that are involved. So in water, we're looking at interaction of one of the lone pairs in an sp3 orbital on oxygen. And we're looking at that interacting with the carbocation empty p orbital as shown here. And again, in terms to maximize the orbital overlap, you could see that these orbitals will approach and interact through this orientation. As the carbocation is planar, you would fully expect the water to come in 50% from the left and 50% from the right. And that's what happens. Again, the angle of attack of water onto the carbocation is the same. And so we get an equal attack from either side of the planar carbocation. If we now consider how a nucleophile, in this case ammonia, reacts with a CX bond in a halogen alkane, Again, we can explain the angle of attack of the nucleophile through orbital overlap. As you can see here, we've got a lone pair on ammonia in sp3 orbital interacting with the empty sigma star orbital, the CX bond. To maximize orbital overlap, the angle of attack of ammonia on that CX bond is an angle of 180 degrees. And by putting electrons into the antibonding orbital, we cause the CX bond to break. So what happens in this reaction is we make a new NC bond at the same time as we break the CX bond. 